Here we'll draw the ear in coronal perspective with the subject facing towards us. So show the 3D planes, superior inferior, medial lateral, and anterior posterior. We include in this diagram an insert to show some of the more complicated ear anatomy, which we'll not attempt to draw. Draw the outer ear, then draw the external ear canal, which extends through the tympanic portion of the temporal bone just in front of the mastoid process. Next draw the tympanic membrane. Now draw the middle ear canal, which also lies mostly within the tympanic portion of the temporal bone. Indicate that from lateral to medial it contains three ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes, which are Latin for hammer, anvil, and stirrup, respectively. Indicate that the stapes abuts the oval window. When sound is transmitted through the ossicles, the stapes pushes the oval window into the inner ear canal. We remember the orientation of these ossicles with the acronym MIS. Opposite to the oval window, draw the round window. Next, show that the eustachian tube extends from the middle ear into the nasopharynx, which allows your middle ears to equilibrate with the atmospheric pressure in your nasopharynx when you swallow. Two important muscles exist within the middle ear canal, the tensor tympani, which is innervated by the trigeminal nerve and which acts on the tympanic membrane, and the stapedius muscle, which is innervated by the facial nerve and which acts on the stapes. Auditory abnormalities in Bell's palsy are often ascribed to stapedius muscle inactivity. Next, let's draw the inner ear canal, which lies within the petrous portion of the temporal bone. We draw it in three different parts. First, sketch the semicircular canals, which lie in supralateral position and serve vestibular function. Then draw the cochlea, which is shaped like a snail's shell and lies in anterior inferior position and serves auditory function. Lastly, label the vestibule, which lies in between the cochlea and semicircular canals. It transmits sound waves from the oval window to the cochlea and contains the otolith organs which provide vestibular cues. Draw the cochlear duct, then label the vestibular duct, which is continuous with the vestibule, and next label the tympanic duct, which ends in the round window. Hence, the round window is also called the secondary tympanic membrane. Denote that Reisner's membrane separates the vestibular and cochlear ducts. Denote that the Basler membrane separates the cochlear and tympanic ducts. And denote that the vestibular and tympanic ducts are filled with perilymphatic fluid, which is high in sodium and low in potassium, much like extracellular fluid. Then denote that the cochlear duct is filled with endolymphatic fluid, which is high in potassium, and low in sodium, much like intracellular fluid. Denote that Meniere's syndrome, bouts of vertigo, low frequency hearing loss, and ear fullness is thought to be due to pathologically elevated endolymphatic sodium concentration, so it's commonly treated with salt-wasting diuretic medications. Now let's address what occurs when a sound wave is detected. Indicate that when a sound wave enters the external ear canal, it vibrates the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane then transmits the wave through the ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes, and the stapes strikes the oval window. When the oval window vibrates, a fluid wave passes through the vestibule and the vestibular duct. Show that the vestibular and tympanic ducts connect at the apex of the cochlea, which is also referred to as the helicotrema, and that the sound wave passes across the apex into the tympanic duct, through the tympanic duct, and then pushes the round window into the air-filled middle ear canal. In this process, the auditory sensory organ, the organ of corti, which lies along the basilar membrane, is activated for sound detection. 
Denote that high frequency sounds activate hair cells at the base of the cochlea, near the oval and round windows, whereas low frequency sounds activate hair cells at the apex of the cochlea. The basilar membrane is thinnest at its base and widest at its apex. Now let's learn about the major vestibular components of the ear, the otolith organs and the semicircular canals. Within the vestibule, indicate the saccule, which detects vertical movement, meaning gravity, and the utricle, which detects horizontal, forward-backward movement. Finally, shade in the semicircular canals, horizontal, posterior, and anterior. They lie perpendicular to one another and detect rotational acceleration, which we address elsewhere. Finally, draw the vestibular and cochlear segments of the vestibulocochlear nerve. This concludes our diagram.